Um, before, I, before I start, I would like to pray a small prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, you know, you know me better than anyone else. You know my limitations, Lord. I'm not a person with eloquence in speech, but I really believe, Lord, what you said in your word, that you are strong in weakness. So I ask your blessing. Amen. Okay, let's see. Uh, before, I, you know, I, I really believe that um, when you go over 30 minutes, 35 minutes, probably going to be, I'm going to have, I'm going to see people sleeping or, you know, so distracted. So I really believe I'm going to try my best to do this, mess, bring this message in 30 minutes. So I'm going to time myself here. <laughs> so hopefully, okay, start. All right. So this is how I'm going to do it. Um, okay. So the title of my message here is Fear Not. I want to thank Sheila and Debbie. Beautiful. You did a marvelous job on that special music. I really love that, that song. And it goes well with the, the message that I'm bringing, which is Fear Not. Where did I get this uh, Fear Not idea? Or why did I choose this? And how was Sheila, Sheila read uh, 1 John 4, 16 to 18. There's a verse there that says, perfect love casts out fear. That to me didn't make sense. And, and for a long time, I, I, I struggled with this. Because I would think that uh, lots courage casts out fear. It makes more sense to me. Courage casts out fear. Or Faith casts out fear, but love, love. Where does that come from? But I'll be able to explain, and I actually, and there is a reason why. John, and, and we know John was the apostle of love, right? The loving apostle. First John is actually the whole, the whole book. It's about love. Acquiring this perfect love. But anyway, let me just uh, continue here. So I decided to, with these, this verse, I decided to dissect this verse, to go deep and, and, and just try to understand it. I'm going to start with fear. What is fear? And this is the definition I got from the Webster Dictionary. What is fear? Fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat to our life. I'm going to also read what the medical science says about fear. The fear, what it causes to our body. And listen closely to what, I, what I'm going to read. Fear, if you have fear, it weakens our immune system. It can cause cardiovascular damage, gastrointestinal problems such as ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome, and if this wasn't enough, and decreased fertility. It can lead to accelerated aging. Imagine that. Accelerated angi. That's why I'm probably getting old. And even premature death. This is serious stuff. Fear. This is why I, I, I decided to talk about this. Now, uh, there's two types of fear from what I, I read and studied. There's the rational fear. <clears throat> rational fear, which is... Rational fear is, is actually a fear that we are born with. Even Adam had this rational fear. And I'll explain it better later. And there's the irrational fear. 
Irrational fear is the phobias that you've heard about. You know what, it, what uh, the, the number one phobia is in, world, in the world? Anyone? Number one phobia. Close. Spiders. Number one fear, spiders. And, uh, and there's the mild uh, irrational, irrational fear or aggressive, right? Uh, anxiety. Anxiety is, is kind of fear also. It's a worriness when you worry a lot. And I tell you, there's a lot of people that worry constantly, always worrying, always worrying. In uh, Matthew 6, 25, which I'm just going to mention, you don't have to look at it. Or you can write it down. To, it says, God says not to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow. Like if pe some people don't worry at all, right? They just stay home, do nothing, and expect them, somebody to feed them, right? That's not worry. That's not it. The worry that Jesus is talking about is the worry of tomorrow. A lot of people are worried about if I'll have a job next week or next month, if I'll be able to pay my bills next month. They always worry. And that's a sickness. You can actually get the same symptoms that I, that I mentioned about the, you know, those symptoms of fear. You can actually suffer from the same uh, uh, consequences in worrying so much. Fear can actually destroy a person's life. I don't know if you agree with me, but it's, you see it all around us. Even with this uh, pandemic, people are constantly fearful, fearful, fearful. Um, we have a scene in, in, the, in, Portu in Portugal, uh, confronting the fears. We have a saying, is to grab the bull by its horns, confronting fear. Uh, I have an experience, uh, many experiences, but one of my, that I wasn't too long ago, when we had some friends over from Portugal, we, we took them around and we, we decided to go to the CN Tower. I don't know if anybody, have anyone been to CN Tower? Lots, right? Is there a reason why you're not going there? Is it because of fear? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not very good uh, with heights. I have to confront it, I, you know. I remember, uh, you know, going up a ladder, a step ladder. Was, I was like shaking a little. So I had to confront my fears, fear of flying, all those things. And I remember uh, going to CN Tower. And the, I don't know if you know, but CN Tower it has some glass floors, right? You can actually see right through, right down. Even the elevator takes you up, there's a section that has glass, so you can actually see down. And I tell you, uh, I was so close to that glass on the elevator, because it was, you know, it was crowded. So they kind of pushed me there. I had no choice, I had to stand there. Well, that was scary. But then, you know, once you, I got comfortable, and so on. But in Seattle Tower, I decided to confront my fears. And it was actually my sister-in-law, that she was kind of hesitant too. She grabbed me by the arm, and we crossed that uh, glass floor. And, I, I, and, we, and when we were crossed, I said, okay, hold on, stay there, both of us. So we stayed in the center of that glass. And I had to do it because I had to confront my fears. I had to go uh, uh, overcome this fear that I had. This was on, a, it's actually a second floor. This is where the, I think the restaurant is. And when you go down the stairs, there's another glass floor. And that one, if you fall, you go straight down to the, the ground. <laughs> My logic is, OK, the first one is not bad. If I fall, the other one will grab, will hold on to me, my weight, right? That's why it was my logic, right? So I said, no, I have to go down to this, the one below and stand there so I can confront my fears. And that's what I did. And I was looking down. I wasn't shaking. Was, and, I, and of course, I, I prayed to God about this. You know, Lord, help me confront this. So I overcame it. It was fantastic. I remember when I used to, going on a plane, a week, two weeks before, I was already dying, right? I was sick. I knew that plane was going to fall when I, when I was in that plane, right? So I was shaking and, and uh, 
you know, turbulence is not a, it's, nobody likes turbulence in a plane, especially when it's really bad. And, uh, uh, but you know, I, I overcame that. And today, you know, thank God, I, I, I actually sleep on the plane, you know, and I talk, I, I'm in God's hands, you know. So that's my, a little bit of my experience with fear. What is the root cause of fear? I'm going to ask a question to you. What is the first time that fear is mentioned in the Bible? Anybody know? The first time fear is mentioned in the Bible. Sorry? Abraham? Fear, fear. Where is fear mentioned? Abraham? No? Adam and Eve, yes. I want that. Uh, uh, Scott is going to put it on the. Is that? Yeah? No? Scott, can you put that uh, Genesis 310? I'm going to. I think I'm going to use my glasses. I don't know where. I, oh, okay. I'm going to use my glasses to read it. Uh, you know, before. before um, let me see. Before, actually, it's, it's verse 10, but I want to start with verse 9. Verse 9 goes like this. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Remember, this is after they disobeyed and ate from the forbidden fruit. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. This is the first time. Fear, you know, in the Bible. Fear is, believe it or not, fear is the cause of sin. Sin brought fear. The fear of, and, and what, what I learned is, is fear from disobedience. Or, I can add to that, fear of punishment. When Adam and Eve feared, what they feared was punishment from disobeying God. That's why they were feared. And he says that he was naked. I, I didn't, you know, come to you because I was naked. Adam and Eve were not naked. What they, they, they stitched, right, or something. They put uh, uh, some kind of uh, fig leaves, right, to cover themselves. They were not naked. But they knew what they did. See, when, when the Bible talks about that when they ate the fruit, they, their eyes were opened. Their, their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. When it says that their eyes were opened to evil, they never had evil before. They never did anything bad. Their eyes were opened to evil. And look what happened shortly after they ate from the fruit. They're starting to, their minds were already corrupting. They're already thinking bad things, bad thoughts. That's what their eyes were open to, to evil. I'm going to ask uh, Scott to put uh, another verse there. This is on Mark, Mark 4. And I just want to read Mark 4, 38, 40. This is when... Jesus, you know, after he preached so long, for so long, and, you know, and I believe he did, it was getting dark, and he wanted the people to go back to their homes. So they decided, he told the, the, the disciples, the apostles, to let's cross the lake. And actually, you know, I think it's Matthew mentions one boat, but Mark, uh, actually, uh, there's more than one boat involved in carrying all the apostles. They were 12, right? At least 12. The, the, the boat that um, the boat that um, Scott is going to show later, it, it, you'll see the size of this boat. It's about 20, they say they found, the archaeologists found the boats of those days. It's about 27 feet long, uh, about 7 feet wide, and 4 feet high. So not a big boat. Right? And it had a sail and so on. And we'll see a little bit there. But uh, what Mark, uh, reading Mark 4, 38, 40, this is when the, the storm, right? The big storm, the waves were actually 
crossing the boat. They were filling the boat with water. Jesus was sleeping in a pillow. He was so tired. Imagine that. He was so tired with all the movement. Small boat with the waves. He was getting wet. He didn't wake up. He was so tired. And uh, so the, 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 the apostles came to him. Lord, you know, don't you think... Don't you, care that you, don't you care that we drown? We're going to die. And then we read this passage. But he was in a stern sleeping on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And then to four, uh, 39 and 40. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And, he, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And this is what he said. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? In other words, why are you terrified? How is that you have no faith? So there's two types of fear that the Bible talks about. The fear of punishment, punishment, and the fear of not having faith. These are the two fears that the Bible talks about. We also learn that we Christians, we shouldn't be afraid even of our enemy. Even Satan, we shouldn't be fear of him. Because if we have Jesus in our hearts, if we have Jesus in our hearts, and by the name, when you pronounce the name of Jesus, if you're being tempted or being, you know, if you see something that's not natural, supernatural, if you say the name of Jesus, he will flee from us. That's the promise, right? So disobedience. Disobedience here is also, well, the... One of the causes of fear is disobedience, which is punishment, which brings punishment. The other fear is not knowing God. When you don't have trust, when you, when you don't have faith, it's, it's, it's basically saying that you don't know God enough. You don't know God. Because once you know what God has done, what is, he is doing, and what he will do in our lives, there's no reason for not trusting him, nor not trusting his, for his promises. Now, how do we overcome fear? That's the next question I, I, I made, uh, I, I had in my, for myself. How do I overcome fear? The, when we read First John, when we read First John, it talks about First John four. It talks about the method is love. Like I mentioned, I couldn't understand this, but it became clearer as I studied more and more. Um, but how do we acquire perfect love? The only person. Well, I shouldn't say that. Our best example as a perfect love, we all know, right? Jesus. Jesus is the best example of perfect love. When we read a, his life story, we can see how much love he had for us, for humanity. You know, his sacrifice on the cross. You know, the Bible mentions that the greatest love is when you give your life to a friend. And that's what Jesus did for us, right? That's what Jesus did for us. So that's the perfect love. But is it possible to be like Jesus? Is that God's wish that we be like him in character? Uh, you know, the, the Greeks, the Greeks, I don't know if they, they, I believe they still use this word, but they have a lot of words for love. They have the love of family, the, the love, romantic love, erotic love, the love of brotherly, brotherly love, and there's the agape love. 
Agape love is the unconditional love, the sacrificial love. Unconditional love is what Jesus had. And that's the love that God wants to put in our hearts. Unconditional love is the love that you, when someone is, is, wants to hurt you and says bad things about you, it's the love that you really, you don't retaliate. You still love that person. You still have compassion for that person. You have pity on that person. And that's what Jesus did. You, you, we see that, right? Jesus on the cross, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, right? That's the agape love, the sacrificial love, unconditional love. There's a verse that I like to, um, uh, Scott, to put on the, on, the, on the display there. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Four to seven. It goes like this. This is Paul talking here. What a great man. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's, the, that's it, right? So this is perfect love. This is what, you know, this is what perfect love is all about. Um, we might say, but uh, what about Jesus? Did Jesus fear? Did Jesus fear anything? Did Jesus fear anything? Yes. He did. Yeah, the, 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 just before he died, he feared. Gethsemane, right? Gethsemane. Yeah. You know, the fear that Jesus had is not what we, th we can't imagine. The fear that he had is that he knew what he was going to go through the torture, the pain. He didn't know if he was going to be successful. He didn't know that he, if he was going to be able to redeem us. His fear was, I don't know if I'm be able to redeem mankind. I don't know if I can go through this, right? That was his fear. He, did, he didn't fear death. Jesus never feared death. But he feared not being successful. That was his fear. Now, I said that, so perfect love, we, could, we can acquire this perfect love. And, uh, and there's a way, there's a very easy way. It's all up to us. The two greatest gifts that God gave humanity. Anybody? First gift, the best gift. What was the best gift that God gave humanity? Jesus, thank you for exactly. Jesus is the best gift, right? Best gift. It's, it's there. If we read the First John 4, as we read 16 and, and so on, to, uh, it's in uh, 1 John 4, 9. It's, it's talking about God's gift to the humanity, Jesus. And the second most valuable gift, what was it? What is it? What is it? Life. Sorry? Life. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. No, no. The second, first Jesus, the second greatest gift. We all have him. I hope we do. The Holy Spirit. Thank you. That's the second most powerful gift. You know, the, the, the Holy Spirit in the Bible, it says that he comforts. He counsels, he intercedes, he mourns. Holy Spirit is a person. It's God. It's also God. He's God also. Third person of the Trinity, right? The main purpose of the Holy Spirit, the main purpose is to empower you and me. For what? To overcome sin. 
overcome sin. See, God knows that our character has to be transformed. Right? When Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again, otherwise you won't go into heaven, you won't enter heaven, he's talking about the character. Our character has to be transformed. And the only one that can do that is the Holy Spirit. What is character? Here's where the character traits. What are the character traits of a person? Honesty, loyalty, kindness, politeness, respectfulness, patient, generosity, loving. Bad character is the opposite. So it is God's intention to change our character. If we don't have a changed character, Right? If we don't have a, a, a transformed character, then we're not living the new life. We are not born again. Born again is a new life. If your character is not like Christ, you're not living the new life. That's what I understand in the Bible. And James 1.18, it says that... Uh, it's through the word of God that we are transformed. So the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to transform us, to transform our character. I have here that uh, also in 1 Corinthians 3, I didn't give Scott this verse, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 17, it talks about the temple of God, that we are the temple of God. And you know what? Sometimes we use this temple of God out of context in many times. We always think the temple of God is what we eat. You know, we shouldn't eat certain things, stuff like that. We shouldn't drink certain things. It's more than that. It's much more than that. When you read it, you'll understand it. The context is the character. It's talking about the character. It's talking about what you're feeding your mind. It's not just the mouth, it's the mind. What we feed our minds will result in what type of character we have. If we feed our minds with God's word, with prayer, meditating, doing, trying to do his will, keeping his laws, then our character will be like Christ. So be careful what you're feeding your minds. I have to be careful too. I'm talking to myself here. This message is for me first, first of all. I hope you can, I can share with you. So it's a symbolism, really. The temple of God is a symbolism of our character. In many ways. I'm not saying that it's, uh, that uh, also we should be careful what we eat and what we in all kinds of things. Of course, you know, what we eat will affect our minds too, right? We're all in agreement with that. Okay, I'm, re I'm reaching the end. And uh, I don't know. Let me see if, uh, if I'm on time here. Um, okay. Oh, I still have two minutes. Wow. David, your sermon back then is working out for me. Um, so I have two minutes. So if I go a little over, you know, I apologize. But the conclusion is, conclusion. I ask the question again, what is perfect love? Perfect love is loving fully, is not lacking anything. It's reaching your full potential as Christians. Is, it is Christian maturity, is being mature, you know, not lacking anything. The only way we're gonna know what perfect love is, is knowing God. We have to, 
we have to search for God. We have to read the Bible. It's only, it's only, it's only it makes sense to me, right? Read his word. Understand what he's saying to us. And try and follow, follow his teachings. Once you know who, who God is, the creator of the universe, once you, you read what Jesus did in, in this world, how he lived, what he sacrificed, right? All because he loved us. Because he's love. He loves us so much, each one of us. He loves the criminal. He, he loves the assassin. He loves all, he, each, each one. He loves all. He doesn't love the sin, but he loves each one of us. And he wants to save us all, right? So, uh, there's also a, a verse that I, there was actually a few verses that I wanted to read. And I think I should do it now. Let me see. I should do it now. Some of these verses. Uh, nope, it's not this. You know. Let me. See. Okay. Okay, just finished my time. Uh, okay, here it is. My page here. Uh, there's a few verses that I uh, that I decided to read for you here. Uh, the first first one, Scott. Which ones did I? No, I did. I didn't give it to you. Sorry. No, no. That's okay. I'll read it from here. The first uh, verse I'd like to read for you is Second Timothy, one, uh, chapter one, verse seven. And, go, and, go, and God says like this: For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love, and of a sound mind. There's another one here I like to read: Psalms twenty-seven, one. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And there's another one here I like to read. This is Jesus. Peace I, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And the last verse I like to read is 1 John 4.17. And I believe Scott has that one. First, first John 4. No. Sorry, sorry. Um, I think it's Isaiah 40. Isaiah? Yes. 41.10. Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Or without courage, right? For I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Some of the promises of God, right? So what is, perf what is perfect love again? Perfect love is living like Christ lived in this world. Is acting as he acted in this world. Speaking as he spoke in this world, loving like he, like he loved the world. Is it possible to have perfect love? Yes. And there's quite a few heroes of the faith that had perfect love. Uh, it was mentioned in Sabbath school, our brother David, the three uh, friends of Daniel, right? I never can recall his, their names. Meshach, Abdenego, and some uh, strange names. They had perfect love. Of course they did. They were willing to die a fiery death for God. They loved God. We have David, right? David confronted the, a bear, confronted a lion, and confronted uh, uh, Goliath, right? He loved God so much. Abraham, Moses, Paul. Boy, what a, he's one of my heroes of the New Testament, Paul. You know, what he went through. He was shipwrecked three times. One time he had the whole overnight just uh, floating in, in the water. It's in the Bible. 
Peter, John, perfect love. So we can also acquire perfect love. That is my prayer to you and to myself, that we let the Holy Spirit work in our hearts. And for sure, for sure, we will be, because 1 John 4, 17, it says that we are like Jesus in this world. If you have perfect love, you are like Jesus in this world. God bless. Thank you. It may be, it may not be your gift, but it's certainly <laughs> powerful words for us today, particularly in this time when, as you said, there's so much fear around COVID and the other things that hound us in this world. We are delighted to see Sonny and Tina and babes with us today. Praise God. Uh, we're going to have our closing hymn five to four, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Thank you, Eugenio, for that message. If you were afraid, we didn't know it. <laughs> How many of you have fears? Raise your hand if you have fears. We all have fears. And Eugenio mentioned that sometimes fear can wreck your life. And um, I know that personally to be true. Fear keeps you from doing things. And it can keep you from doing the things God has called you to do. And so we need to trust in Jesus. Amen. <laughs> so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus says the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove to more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me. Neath the healing, cleansing flood, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, Jesus, precious Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me till the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious 
precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Uh, from the back to the front, and sort of one row at a time, wait for one row to leave for the next row. So we'll start on, on your left. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, and the Lord, thank you for the messages and word and song this day that you have given us. May we be still and know that the, you are the God that will strengthen us to trust to obey and permit you to carry us through the week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.